All right. Thank you, everyone, for joining us today uh, for the virtual finance, uh, virtual vision finance, understanding traders COVID nineteen edition. Uh, I'm here with our esteemed panel of speakers, and my name is Stephen Atsakis. I'll be moderating this panel, um, and you know, uh, again, our speakers are here to provide you with insight regarding ways that traders um, have been dealing with the market conditions since the start of the pandemic. So on that note, before I introduce our speakers, um, before they introduce themselves, I wanted to let you know that you could submit comments here and we'll be taking questions afterwards as well. So thanks again for joining us uh, from no matter where you are in the world, um, as, long, uh, as well as for our speakers who are here from different parts of the world today. So let's dive right in. Uh, for our speakers, please uh, briefly introduce yourself and share what about your positions allows you uh, to know about traders' behavior. And we could start with Anne. Great. Thanks, Steve. Uh, so my name is Anne Hunt. I'm the CEO of Chasing Returns. Um, we're an Irish headquartered company um, and we partner with large brokers to provide both behavioral analytics uh, in terms of helping traders figure out their strengths and weaknesses and uh, try and act on those. Um, and we also recently launched a, a risk console called Playmaker, which allows traders to track and monitor against their own plans. So we're coming to this, um, I guess, the biggest period of high volatility that we've seen since the company uh, was formed about five years ago. So we've had a really interesting couple of months just examining what happens to beginners, what happens to experienced traders, different types of styles of trading and how um, our different traders have reacted. So I'll be able to talk a little bit about some of our insights there. I'm sure uh, we all look forward to hearing you. Um, okay, Eugene, can you uh, go next and give us some background? Yeah, thank you, Stephen. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me, Eugene Sorensen. Uh, I'm the Chief Product Officer uh, here at Chart IQ. Uh, Chart IQ is we provide uh, infrastructure tools, uh, development tools for uh, actual vendors. Uh, so, and also banks and inst uh, brokers uh, use our our tools. So, our experience really is is uh, one step removed from the trader, but we are we get a broad spectrum of vision from speaking to all of our different clients and the challenges that they're uh, having or or the opportunities that they see. And that ranges the spectrum from uh, Bitcoin to uh, equities, uh, really commodities, et cetera, right? Um, you know, quick introduction of, of myself is uh, I started my career in the seat of, of many of our viewers today as, a, as an analyst and trader. Uh, I then about 20 years ago moved into financial software uh, first with uh, a group called CQG in the technical analysis space. That's always sort of been my core uh, focus. Uh, and then on uh, to Canner and Bloomberg where I oversaw the graphics on the terminal. And now here at Chart IQ uh, with, as I said, the opportunity to build new tools and address the needs of, of today's traders. Excellent. And uh, Nima uh, or Jerome, since we were keeping it in alphabetical uh, pretty much order. So I'll, I'll, uh, I'll go. Uh, hello, everybody. A uh, pleasure to meet you for this uh, virtual expo. So my name is Jean Favres. I'm the managing director of Trading Central Labs, which is a fintech uh, powerhouse that uh, works on building new investment tools using uh, AI, machine learning, and NLP. Uh, we cover whole range of asset classes, all types of uh, product suites, fundamental, technical, sentiments. Uh, and as for myself, uh, before I uh, created uh, Trading Central Labs, uh, I was 20 years on uh, trading floors for houses like Barclays, Dutch Bank, Subgen, doing equity link strategy for, uh, for these banks. So I do have some a bit of a knowledge with the, those, uh, those uh, funky guys uh, known as traders. Excellent. And Nima, if you could take us away. You got it. Uh, nice to see you again, Stephen and you as well. Eugene Jerome. Pleasure, pleasure to meet you guys. My name is Nima CR, Chief Sales Officer for the FX Primus Group. Um, I've been working in the Forex industry for about 12 years, uh, with about 20 years in the financial service industry based in uh, Southern California. I'm based in our headquarters now in Limassol, Cyprus, but essentially I overlook uh, the global sales operations for the company. 
Uh, we operate six offices globally, and I feel that uh, my insights from, let's say, the retail broker perspective might bring some additional insights from uh, being on the front line, per se. Uh, so I'm looking forward to uh, hearing your, your feedback and input and sharing some tidbits of myself as well. Excellent. So uh, without further ado, I mean, uh, you know, the, the main question that, you know, is on the mind of, I think, everyone here and all the traders and, and investors is, you know, over the past couple of months, I would say since February, you know, the markets have been so turbulent. Uh, there's been so much volatility, so much uncertainty uh, with the COVID-19, you know, pandemic globally. Uh, what would you all say is the uh, most significant changes that you've spotted, you know, from market participants and investors uh, between, say, February and now? And feel free, whoever wants to start this off. Uh, well, I'll go ahead and, and jump in. Certainly, uh, what we've been hearing from, from our clients uh, is... You know, massive volume increases, of course, and but principally in the equity space, uh, equities and commodities, uh, less so than the uh, uh, than the FX and Bitcoin space. Uh, really, it seems you know people are attracted to to volatility. That's where they see opportunity, and uh, so that's really drawn them into. Uh, you know, looking at those markets and trying to, to understand and uh, understand the market depth, what's going on, where the opportunities are. Obviously, we've also seen a big divergence in uh, industries, right, in sectors. Uh, so looking at sector analysis and trying to understand which markets are, or which uh, companies and which sectors are, are trending uh, up or versus down, right? Because obviously, we've seen some big winners and we've seen some big losers. So right. that's... That's a, that's a great a great point with some businesses doing really well during the pandemic. And uh, I, I guess that leads into uh, our subsequent talking points. But is there anyone else that would like to add on this particular topic? Because uh, I'm sure you're all in agreement with uh, Eugene's views, but there might be other perspectives uh, as well that anyone yeah, might like uh, to add. Uh, uh, yeah, Stephen, uh, just to jump in, uh, I would say from a retail perspective and uh, in the time having worked in, let's say, the retail space, I've been around some big, let's say, movements, uh, Brexit aside from, uh, you know, the Swiss National Bank uh, dropping the peg, et cetera, et cetera, some uh, big movements. And what I really noticed uh, during from February up until now, I really, I've seen an increase in the amount of our total traders. Uh, so let's say month over month, I'm seeing a lot more traders. But one interesting dynamic is I'm seeing the average volume per trader is a little lower. Uh, obviously, uh, the volumes are much higher, as uh, Eugene was saying, that, than we've seen in uh, uh, many months. But I'm finding that the average volume per trader has actually decreased. And I don't have a specific uh, understanding why, but if I were to make an estimation, I think it might have to do with more of uh, um, the risk appetites there, but maybe the um, being more cautious with their funds and their equity is there as right. well. Maybe income streams aren't consistent, et cetera, et cetera. So I'm seeing the average volume uh, per trader uh, decrease. Uh, another uh, dynamic that I find quite interesting is that a few of our clients uh, or regions that we have big markets in, in Latin America, specifically, let's say, like Brazil or Turkey and South Africa, where their, uh, let's say, bank accounts are in ex the exotic currency and they've converted their accounts for a USD-based currency uh, trading account. A lot of them have withdrawn because withdrawn funds in order to just get that currency um, disparity, you know, more or less a carry trade, uh, unanticipated carry trade, let's say. So these are probably the two largest uh, observations that I've taken away from these times, but surely uh, very exciting uh, to say the least. Interesting. So I, I guess traders are being more cautious, position sizing more conservatively. Uh, that makes sense. Um, Jerome, uh, what's your take on you know, the, the way that traders have been responding during the pandemic? Uh, I, I will echo what uh, Eugene and Nima said here. It, it was quite interesting uh, period, uh, just like all the crises, actually. <laughs> um, but we, we saw, um, uh, absolutely, uh, a very uh, dramatic change in the way people and uh, traders are looking at markets, and especially the equity markets. Before, we were like in a growth market. Uh, it looks like value is back uh, is back there. People are more looking uh, in depth uh, in terms of analysis. Um, what is quite significantly as well is uh, the volume of uh, news and information people are eager to look at. Uh, we saw that a huge volume uh, published uh, blogs, uh, IDs uh, in the market. Uh, 
people expressing their fear or sharing their ideas and uh, so on and so forth, which is very true for, for retail. Um, it, it's a little bit similar for the uh, professional uh, traders. They were a little bit lost. Uh, no crisis are the same. And uh, it appears as a flash crash uh, at the beginning and uh, it turns very differently now. So it's a, it's a very interesting period. Uh, lots of changes, uh, especially as Eugene said on the equity space uh, where uh, a market is really uh, changing completely. Right, right. Yeah, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a different, I guess, kind of crisis that we have now compared to the flash crash or the last uh, financial crisis, um, which kind of you know, tapered off more slowly. This one was uh, pretty abrupt in March. Um, and what are your views on uh, you know, the past couple of months and the, the traders' uh, reaction to dealing with you know, uh, all this volatility? Here's some really interesting insights. We looked um, at the behavior of beginning traders. So um, one of our studies, we looked at traders who were effectively beginners in January and February when things were nice and quiet versus traders who were beginners in, in March and April. Um, so we saw the most exuberance in beginners in March and April. Um, Compare, you know, the number of transactions per day were probably almost double. Um, but I agree with Neiman, the position sizes weren't bigger, but the volume of trading was bigger. Um, when with our more experienced traders, they tended to be very much dependent on their style of trading. So kind of the trend following traders um, really didn't change very much, but the scalping style of trading, there was huge volume. So overall, we're vo our volumes were a lot higher, but it really came down to your style and your experience. Right. That's interesting. So the beginner, the beginners were a little bit more active than they otherwise normally would have been. Yeah. Uh, and I, I can imagine this is probably because they were all so focused on the news. You know, as uh, as Jerome mentioned earlier, there's so much content that uh, you know we've all been exposed to in the past couple of months. You know, with the pandemic, whether it's vaccine news or cases, it seems like news is driving the markets more than ever. Uh, and that's a question that I, I want to touch on uh, later with regards to, you know, fundamental and technical analysis. Um, my next question is, you know, what are the changes that you're seeing in terms of how traders are actually consuming news and research, whether it comes to, you know, um, looking for new trading opportunities? Um, you know, historically in Forex, they're either using technical analysis, you know, looking at uh, trend lines um, or following, you know, governmental announcements, whether it's, you know, uh, non-farm payroll, pr producer price index, unemployment, et cetera. Um, I feel like that, that might've changed a little bit uh, during the pandemic. You know, what is, what's your take uh, as, you know, content providers, as well as, you know, charting software providers? You know, are, are, are brokers missing out on something here or, or how have traders approached the consumption of news during this time? Go ahead, Troll. No, uh, I, I don't. I, I can think about it because we recently uh, launched a product uh, called uh, Buzz, which is a new way of tackling the, uh, the information overload, or the infobesity, uh, like uh, we would say, because there's too much information and, and it's very difficult to, uh, to consume and take uh, uh, informed and efficient uh, decisions. So uh, news is... The way people are consuming is simple as you have a, th uh, a feed and you read the feed of news the mo from your most preferred uh, sources and you try to find your solutions. Um, what we uh, provided with our solution here is our ability to mix AI, machine learning and NLP and, and help the, the investor by telling him uh, with a visual uh, concept, uh, what stands out, what's buzzing in terms of uh, of news? Because sometimes there are some uh, some elements they don't they don't necessarily uh, see or uh, with their usual uh, with their usual feel, and that's where it's uh, it's kind of uh, interesting because that provides more information. You can uh, digest more. The machine does it for for yourself because at, at this uh, level we are talking about 
digesting millions of articles uh, by uh, by the day. So uh, and what was you the can provide. Uh, I'm sorry. sorry? Uh, what was that product called that you said you guys just launched? Uh, Trading Central Market Buzz. Market Buzz. Okay, so yeah. it like cuts through the noise of uh, of all the information. Absolutely, and uh, we integrated, for instance, with uh, with the new gene uh, platform uh, Chart IQ. Excellent. And um, what is kind of interesting as well, beyond the, the ability to, to cut through the, the, the noise and, and provide insight, is also being able to uh, decipher the, the psychology of the crowd because uh, with the machine, uh, the AI, you are able to, to quantify uh, the positiveness or negativeness uh, within the news. Uh, and you aggregate for everything, which is that gives you a, a sentiment on any asset possible. And sentiment is a great uh, is a great alternative uh, to fundamental or technical that in markets like this are kind of off. The fundamental is clearly off there. Right. A sentiment will give you some sort of uh, timing element. So you might have an idea, but if the crowd the market is against you, you might want to, uh, to step aside for a minute before uh, deploying your, uh, your position. So, right. so that's I, I where think... we, we believe the news are consumed in a different way uh, mm -hmm. and in, uh, in, uh, in a more advanced uh, solution. Okay. Interesting. I, I, uh, I think that's a great answer to the question because it, it sounds to me like uh, usually fundamental news would be more important or technical analysis. And now, because those have kind of lost a little bit of their weight, there's more focus on the sentiment, you know, the expectations. Yeah. And it's like the markets are, are sort of an indication of, of, of not, not of fundamentals anymore, but, but really of just the market sentiment more than ever. Uh, and not to say that sentiment wasn't valued beforehand, but it seems like it's, it's more now. Sorry, Eugene. Yeah, I, I, f I fully concur, and I, but I think it also plays to what both Ann and Nemo were saying is uh, there's, you know, Nemo saying we have a growth in the number of traders and Ann is seeing a lot of uh, early traders, enthusiastic traders, right? I think those are traders who also look to news, right? Uh, there's people who are at home, right? They don't have as much to do. They're following the news. It's obviously a crisis that's in front of us. We're all looking at it. So, and, and they don't have the same knowledge of doing fundamental analysis or doing technical analysis. That requires a, a deeper study into, into the markets. Newer traders are going to be driven and think about news. I think tools uh, like TC Buzz um, that are, are doing sentiment analysis, uh, Rave Impact, Market Early Bird, are uh, great analytical solutions that uh, pull news together uh, or social information together that, that are driving, just as I was mentioning before, around sectors, right? It's from the news that you're going to be able to learn, you know, what's going on in shipping, right? There's no, there's not too much uh, information uh, from the fundamental side, right? Unless you're looking at alternative data and essentially that's what Jerome is producing is alternative data. There's other sources of alternative data, but it's really being able to bring all those different content sets together uh, so that you can really tell a complete story and blend that content together, as, as Jerome was saying, putting that, uh, you know, the time series analysis of, of your sentiment together with your price analysis. That's what's really going to be able to drive it. And then as you can lay in other information, uh, you'll really be able to, to get a full story um, and make, and make a, an intelligent trading decision. Excellent. Yeah, that's, uh, those are great points uh, with regards to, you know, finding up uh, trading opportunities, which is, is really, uh, you know, kind of what it's all about, you know, for traders navigating these markets. They're like, you know, where should I invest my money? What, what should I trade? You know, there's so much volatility. Um, but as you mentioned, you know, certain sectors, you know, uh, might be doing a lot better than others, as we've seen. Um, and uh, you mentioned earlier about um, the shift, you know, the focus on, st on stocks and commodities and kind of, you know, FX didn't get as much of the volatility, although I'm sure, you know, volumes were higher on the FX side as well. Um, you know, what are your thoughts on the, you know, the intense focus on equities, on stocks, on commodities? 
where FX kind of was in the background and not as much as, as a focus? You know, was the, were the quantitative easing packages to blame? The fact that all the central banks kind of acted in unison? Uh, I mean, we saw a huge, you know, um, sell-off uh, with the dollar strengthening um, in March, uh, but then kind of like a V-shaped recovery. So, you know, why, why weren't FX markets as, as uh, lucrative? I mean, there's been obviously a lot of volume, but uh, what are your thoughts about the volumes? And, you know, did you see traders moving to stocks that were previously FX only or a greater shift over from, you know, the CFD traders to equities and away from Forex? So perhaps Nima, you could share some views, you know, from the brokerage side. Sure. Well, even uh, to re reiterate what Eugene had said, uh, you know, we did see actually a big shift with uh, more people trading equities. And I think in, in most cases, as Eugene said, a lot of people are at home, they have access to news, maybe not as much to do, et cetera. But uh, we did see a huge shift or uh, I guess um, I wouldn't call it a cross up, but a big movement of users going from FX or at least diversifying their portfolios into equities. And I would imagine uh, could be possibly just, you know, the, the paradigm of, you know, Investing in equities is a little more safer and uh, less uh, less risky than, let's say, the the traditional forex product. So, uh, you know, we did see a big uptick, you know, for uh, uh, airline stocks, um, big pharma, et cetera. But obviously, with a platform like ours, you know, it's uh, purely CFD. So we had a lot of people trading and speculating that these products were actually going to decrease in value as opposed to uh, long term strengthening. But um, you know, being that we are a pure STP broker, you know, we seeing all these high volumes, et cetera, and seeing our traders diversify their portfolios, et cetera, is very exciting to see. But uh, a lot of people, because, you know, technical analysis to a certain extent, uh, is not as valid as it once was, particularly in specific products, like oil, for example, and the fundamental analysis in most cases was having very little uh, impact on the movement. So it was going to, you know, market sentiment. And I was finding that a lot of traders were making, um, not unmethodical uh, decisions, risky decisions, more or less gambling, not so much trading. So it was slightly concerning to see, but definitely I did see uh, uh, many traders uh, diversifying their portfolio, uh, moving into uh, gold, a lot of people trading gold and definitely into the equities as well. Yeah, and, and, uh, just one point as well, we, we shouldn't also forget that with the COVID, uh, the, the crisis uh, build up, we also had this massive drop in the oil prices uh, that completely changed the, the, the landscape of investment. Uh, so that's definitely also a big element that, uh, that has created this uh, uh, airdrop uh, in, in the market. And that was quite significant uh, for commodities and for stocks, uh, just like you said, for some sectors that were massively uh, hammered uh, there. And, uh, that are still uh, struggling quite uh, quite significantly. Right. Yes. The uh, the extreme uh, volatility and, and price drop in, in oil. Um, uh, and I, I've spoken to investors as well that that tried to diversify, uh, which leads me into my next question. You know, um, but and before I go into that, is there anything you wanted to add with regards to um, you know the last question of of just watching traders you know shift or trade equity for, for the first time and, and CFDs, you know, like Nima said, maybe it was the ability to short um, certain equities using CFDs as opposed to, you know, trading actual stocks where you can only maybe buy an option contract to, to go short or, you know, because it might be harder to bor borrow the stock from an online broker uh, or using a, a leveraged ETF that's short. Uh, did you see a lot of beginner traders uh, go straight into equities as opposed to Forex? Or any crossover? Uh, Forex um, at the minute. So most of our traders would have been um, starting and staying in, in the Forex markets. Um, we, we have a lot of education that comes with our software. And, and one of the things we tell all beginners very early on is that if you can stick to five products or less, you're way more likely to be successful than the you know trading anything that's moving kind of thing so we have we have a lot of positive nudging around don't be moving around across all the markets and and actually it's clearly working because our we didn't really see a lot of of switching um and the places we did so the trend type traders right um they did the best um whereas the scalpers or the, there was a lot of 
gambling. There was a lot of, you know, as as Nima said, you know, sentiment is here, let me in, let me out kind of stuff. And even our successful winning traders um, still did well scalping, but they didn't do as well in March, April as they did January, February. So we saw that that behavior uh, very strongly, but I don't have a strong analysis across the different asset classes. I would, I would uh, add for a moment that I would think that the FX markets and the, the, this strong trends that will come in the FX markets coming out of this, right? As we begin to see countries open up and we begin to see the impact, uh, the economic impact, which is gonna differ significantly around the world, uh, we're gonna see different uh, fiscal policies executed. We already have, right? Europe's behave very differently just because of the whole structure of the, of the economy and, and the social network uh, support system there than the United States. That's gonna have long-term ripple effects in the FX market because that's what's gonna change those underlying fundamentals in the market. So I would think that, that the uh, FX space will be really interesting coming out of this as the equity market uh, begins to calm. I wouldn't want to venture as to when, but I think that will happen. Yeah, hopefully those those trends are, are going to be lasting. So, uh, you know, traders can take advantage of them uh, and feel more confident at least about their trading. Um, and I, I wanted to add on, on my earlier question with regards to, you know, uh, trading during volatility, whether it's stocks, whether it's, um, you know, FX, commodities, crypto, um, you know, when the markets are volatile like this, the ability to use, whether it's a, you know, stop loss order or limit orders, are you noticing clients, um, you know, leverage different order types uh, to a larger degree? you know, for fear of either getting a margin call um, <clears throat> just because of the crazy moves that have ha happened, you know, to protect their account and to manage their risk differently? Has there been any changes to, you know, the trader psychology from that perspective? In terms of the, the mechanisms of trading, but we certainly have seen with our traders that um, our winning traders, did way better in March and April than they normally do. Um, our losing traders stayed about the same. So that, that's really positive. You know, they didn't lose more money. They would, their expectancies were, were very kind of similar, but um, they were trading a lot more, but they were trading smaller, but yet they had bigger outliers. So clearly, you know, and we have a discipline score we give to traders and the discipline score, a part of a factor of that would be, um, going over the stop loss you've set for yourself. So you, you know, dynamically allocate your capital for the day and maybe you set it to 2%, whatever. We saw more people break that. So it would suggest that possibly um, people were still um, not thinking clearly in terms of their risk parameters and the increase in volatility. So we did see a little bit of that. But overall, because we had the ability to track people and nudge them back to good behavior, thankfully we didn't have huge losses. Um, but there was certainly much more undisciplined behavior going around for the last couple of months. Right. Excellent. Well, it's interesting at least to hear that, you know, it, they didn't just make money on one big trade, even though there were the, those outliers, they, uh, they were, you know, doing a lot of turnover with smaller positions and, and uh, even yes. if they deviated from their, uh, yes. from their strategy. Yes. Uh, Eugene, are there, uh, you know, specific tools that you've seen that have been either more effective or more popular during these times uh, when it comes to charting and technical analysis and moving average? I mean, you know, traders are very passionate about, you know, technical analysis and uh, the hundreds of indicators out there that exist. Um, what, what, what trends have you seen, you know, within your software or within the greater market uh, on the technical side during this time? I think a, a couple, right? So... First is, I think it's, it's really important for uh, traders to be understanding that they need to use different tools during trending markets versus uh, volatile markets or topping or bottoming markets, right? Those are very different kinds of conditions and you need different trading uh, tools and strategies to execute properly in those environments, right? Uh, you know, and so uh, like specifically, you need more uh, tools that provide uh, from a technical point of view unbounded uh, 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 ranges, right? Something that, that's bounded like an RSI or a stochastic uh, just tends to, to limit uh, in a move like this. Whereas uh, tools like MACDs and Bollinger Bands work very effectively 
uh, in volatile markets. Uh, so that's one thing that we've, we've certainly seen. The other thing, and I'd, I'd be actually put the question to the panel if I have insight on it, is uh, the activity in options. Uh, you mentioned that. Uh, we're definitely seeing a, a strong interest in options, and I think that's also true in the, in the broker community, right? The uh, changes in the underlying dynamics of the market, which I think is also affecting uh, some of the introduction of new traders, right? The fact that we've gone to fractional trading, the fact that we have now gone to zero commissions, right? Uh, it's really interesting that those are two things that happened, you know, sort of in the six months prior to uh, the COVID. So they really sort of opened the door uh, to a lot more traders and to people coming in, right? If, if I can trade for free, uh, well, <laughs> you know, that, that's really helpful, right? It, 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 redu it reduces the market friction, right? Uh, and so I think it's, uh, you know, and as I say, fractional trading allows me to participate in big name stocks that I wouldn't otherwise get to because I don't have the capital. Right. So I think that's been the other magnet that's helped draw people to equities. And I think, as you said earlier, right, it's something that people know it's that they get. It's the names they're seeing in the news, you know, uh, airlines. Oh, my God, what an awful space to be in right now. Um, you know, but uh, Zoom, uh, here we are. <laughs> you know, there's a good place to be. Right. Uh, right. So it goes back to your, your sector point earlier. So, yeah. uh, you know, very, very valid points there. And, and thanks for that feedback. I'm sure it's going to be valuable to our listeners. Um, and on, on that note, uh, uh, perhaps Jerome or any, anyone open to this question, uh, with regards to trading signals, you know, obviously, um, whether it's, you know, some newsletter, whether it's an analyst recommendation, whether it's a chart pattern, uh, you know, a, a systems developer that's running some algo, um, what have you observed, I guess, in the past couple of months, you know, typically like algos are known to kind of go, uh, go haywire during extreme market conditions. Are, are, is there a set of maybe patterns or, or algos that performed better than the usual? And, you know, perhaps that could tie back to, you know, what Eugene mentioned where certain technical indicators uh, were less constrained versus others. Um, did you observe any, uh, you know, more successful than usual, um, or did you see the shift go more towards the sentiment side, like you mentioned earlier, where the, the sentiment kind of got more of the weight than, uh, than the other fundamentals or technicals? Uh, that's a great question. Thank you for asking me, and it's a very tricky one. <laughs> right. Uh, <laughs> no easy for answer. For sure. Um, a, a, a crisis like this one or 2008 or any other crisis uh, works in, in sequence. And the beginning is, is usually where the market drops dramatically and you're like, okay, nothing works. So like uh, nobody knows exactly what to use, a fundamental, uh, but you can't necessarily use it. Uh, analysts, uh, uh, they don't necessarily know either where you, where you are. I've been one, so sometimes I was like, don't know what to do. Uh, buy some options to protect your portfolio. <laughs> uh, that's the, the, the safest place. Um, alors, yes, we, we will tend to go and look at technical analysis because technical analysis you use indicators that, that gives you that helps you understand what happened in the past and you expect that it will happen again. Uh, so uh, that would be the, the, the pattern uh, system. Uh, the algorithm, alors, algorithm uh, to, when you are talking about the algorithm, algorithm messes up, yes, uh, because when there's a crash, they have those limits and they tend to uh, to uh, mess the market up, but let's not forget the algorithm is uh, written by a human who uh, might have some different set of boundaries in terms of risk, in terms of, uh, of uh, issues and, and some types of crisis. So algorithm don't necessarily help you uh, there uh, as well. So the first sequence of a crisis, uh, you never know what's going on. You don't know where you, you should turn yourself in terms of finding the right indicator. Um, and that's where actually, uh, as a former professional, I, uh, 
I found some very interesting ways in the, uh, the, the market sentiment um, because it's, it's, it's a good proxy of where we stand. Uh, and beyond the sentiment which is positive or negative, now you are able, or not necessarily available for the retail uh, market, but you are able to extract emotions out of uh, tweets, uh, blogs, or whatever. Uh, emotions like fear, like joy, and uh, being able to quantify elements like fear uh, is a great way also to see uh, if the market participants are uh, in a specific mood and which means that you are at the beginning of the cycle, the, the down cycle or at the end of it. Um, it's an element that will, you won't find, for instance, with uh, volatility indicators like skew or time structure because there's always remanence element there. But the, the sentiment is a great uh, now casting uh, tool to have a snapshot of what the market participant feel or about a country, uh, currency, a commodity or something like this. So it's, um, it's something that is now uh, heavily used in, uh, in the hedge fund industry. Uh, some of, of uh, the big hedge funds are, are quite uh, savvy on that uh, space, like Two Sigma and those guys. Um, You're saying on sentiment, yeah. right? If I hear yes, correctly. And, and using uh, market emotions as well. Um, and it's, uh, it's, uh, it's one of our job also to bring those institutional grade uh, tools on to the retail and make it simpler to use because definitely there's something uh, there that can bring uh, value to uh, any investor uh, in the world, whether it's generating alpha or risk mitigation, definitely. Interesting. I, I feel like the, the sentiment tools are evolving. You know, initially kind of every broker out there had some little set sentiment widget, uh, but then brokers started kind of uh, getting into detail like, only showing their most profitable traders and what the sentiment of those traders were. Um, so I, it seems like your sentiment tools are evolving and uh, you're saying that these were more effective during the pandemic, um, but this could also be a short-lived trend or do you think that you know, uh, when the fundamentals and technicals return a lot stronger, will the kind of shift away from sentiment happen? Alors, yeah, uh, sorry to, to capture the, the audience too much, but uh, yeah, it's a, in this case, it's a, it's a magnificent uh, short-term tool uh, that you, you can use. In normal condition, uh, you don't use sentiment. To, Alone, uh, right. Okay, yeah. that's, that's the, 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 the road to a massive failure, for sure. <laughs> right, um, thank you for explaining it, that. It, 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 the fundamental is you do, you do your due diligence, you, uh, you do your stuff, no problem. You look at the momentum by technical analysis, and then you use sentiment as a timing tool. So in right. normal market condition, works that way, perfect. Uh, when the markets are a bit crazy, you have to shift slightly how you use your, your, uh, your uh, tools. Uh, and and uh, that's, that's quite uh, important. Excellent. Exactly. Thank that's you so much. that's you know that ability to dynamically shift your strategy from one uh, method to another, right? Depending upon the market environment, is really critical. You know what Jerome and, and Trading Central are doing with uh, you know basically taking unstructured data and structuring it and turning it into a metric that you can actually measure and use and add that in to complement your trading strategy, right? So this is an addition to your technical analysis. This is an addition to your fundamental analysis. It's that additional ingredient that you go, oh, as I was saying, you know, you wanna be looking at volatility tools, Bollinger Band, something like that in these volatile markets, that's really gonna help you when you start putting in uh, the sentiment data. And then if you can lay that together with seeing your trades uh, on the chart and you can really create that whole story, then I think, you know, uh, Anne and her analysis is really going to be able to see those clients who are, you know, progressing down that path, 
uh, from from that beginner trader to to the more experienced trader. Yeah, I, I think, and I, and I think the other thing that we find really fascinating is, so we come at behavior, right? Just kind of like a parallel to sentiment is, if you are a fear-based trader, you're going to react to market very different to if you're a greed-based trader. And and we see some of our the the really psychological metrics we have, like one of the simplest metrics we have is how do you behave on your first trade of the day, right? Um, and if that is statistically telling you that you have a strong strength or a weakness, right, it's almost like a proxy for a fear or a greed-based trader, right? So many, many successful traders, if you just took their first trade of the day, they're abysmal. They persistently lose, they have bad win rates, they have terrible risk rewards, et cetera, right? Um, because their greed-based traders can't wait for the market to open, right? And we saw a huge movement in some of those metrics when the volatility was higher, right? But if you have a fear-based trader who takes all day to set up his first trade, but it's really successful for him, right? That's the kind of behavior you want to know about yourself because, you know, you can look at your first trades and go, oh my God, this is an incredible history. I could be a really successful trader. And what we say to them is, yes, you can. You've proved you can do it. Now apply that to the rest of your day, right? So it, it, it's, it's like a personal version of the sentiment thing. It's your own emotional sentiment, really. The triggers right. for people. It's fascinating. Right. Sentiment on a mi micro level, I guess, to the individual. So on that point with fear, it's interesting you, you painted in that context uh, in, a, in a positive light, I guess, because it, it, in that case, it's better for a trader to be, I guess, fearful and take the defensive approach as opposed to the uh, greedy trader. Yes, there's no right answer. I mean, the whole the key thing about emotion is, as long as you understand your biases, then you can react to your, your biases. So, you know, if you happen to be really weak on your first trade of the day, make it small, get it over with, get on with it, right? It's, it, it's not rocket science. Yes, over time, you should try and deal with your issues, um, but similarly with somebody who's strong. So for us, we don't say this emotion's good or this one's bad, or, or we say, understand you suffer from this and find a way to, excuse me, to work around it, right? Right. Um, I, just like with every signal, how do I react when I use this signal and is it working for me? And if not, so it's, it's all about collecting the data, analyzing the data, visualizing it and giving it back to the traders in a way that they can see the actions. Excellent. And, and on that note, with, with regards to signals, um, I mean, I know historically, you know, 15, 20 years ago when the FX markets were more, uh, I guess, trend, the trends lasted a lot longer. And now they're kind of, you know, faster, more efficient, more dynamic. Trends are more fleeting. Uh, I mean, maybe now with the pandemic, some trends will return. But with regard to, you know, when you have software out there that's generating the same signal across multiple brokers, or you have, you know, all these traders that are looking at the same trend line or the same indicator, um, do you think there's any kind of limitation on the scalability of some of these strategies? And are you seeing traders you know, look for alternative strategies or an alternative indicator or some kind of, you know, rare chart pattern uh, to find opportunities as opposed to, you know, everybody jumping into the same signal at the same time and whether that might affect execution or is this like a, not a problem and kind of a non-event because the FX markets are so liquid and this is open to anybody. So, uh, for, for my end, I mean, so many good points were, were just mentioned, but I would say that, uh, let's say, in, in monitoring some of my traders and some of uh, my clients and money managers, I, I see that some people that at one point were very disciplined or that had a strategy that I could identify based on where their entry points and exit points were, um, they, they've almost gone out the window. You know, I, I see a, a total lack of discipline from traders that I've known for years that are very disciplined. And despite having uh, any signal or, you know, any system or even using, you know, Bollinger Bands, looking at the volatility, et cetera, I think probably the biggest, let's say, common mistake that I'm seeing, which I'm not seeing, what I, which I wasn't seeing in the past, was I'm not seeing much of an exit strategy from a lot of traders. They're just kind of getting in trades, they're holding them, and they're just waiting to the markets to jump and just to get out quickly, like a, almost like a scalping strategy to a, a little bit longer term scalping strategy. I don't see much of an ex exit strategy. I'm not seeing uh, as consistently take profits being set, uh, stop losses being set. Uh, so with that being said, this is the more concerning aspect with everything is strategy aside and uh, 
uh, market sentiment, f f fundamental analysis or technical analysis aside, it's the fact that I'm just not seeing much of a, a consistent exit strategy from some of the more disciplined traders that I've seen in the past. And from a beginner trading perspective, I think the exit strategy uh, or exit plan is one of the most underrated things for the, the new trader to learn about. Everybody's like, when do I get in? And I just, I'm more concerned on when I'm going to get out. And this should be in any, all aspects of life, not just trading. Exit strategy is very critical. So yeah. uh, this is probably the most common thing that I'm seeing. I think that's, to the that's top. a great, great point, Nima. You know, and I think, you know, I've looked at this question of, you know, can, you know, the signals, does you have a crowd effect and, and I don't see it, right? I've looked at that throughout my career uh, as, as I've been focused in technical analysis for over 30 years, right? People look at signals differently. They look at different markets. They have different time horizons. They have different execution strategies, capabilities, different risk management strategies. The markets are really deep. But this aspect of how you get in and how you get out, that changes the whole dynamic. It's exactly what Ann is studying, right? And so that's, you know, uh, you can have two traders take exactly the same signal and end up with radically different results, right? And then that entirely changes their market psychology and how they're going to take that next signal, right? Um, you know, the guy who won is going to double down the next time. The guy who lost is going to cut a position in half, right? <laughs> um, and that's actually good risk management, right? You know, is, is if you, your account's growing, yes, you should be more aggressive. Um, actually, I'll let Ann comment on that. She knows that a lot better than I do. <laughs> could uh, get completely different results, but actually a hundred traders would get a hundred different results because the signal is such a tiny piece of it, right? Um, and speaking of streaks, it's, it's yeah, so, you know, again, traders um, can fall into four different categories and they can have two strengths or two weaknesses, but the, the people who, after closing a winner, give it back, um, may also, after closing a loser, lose their confidence. And, and those type of traders have real difficulty um, particularly if they're high volume traders, you know, if they're more scalping and doing 10 or 15 or 20 trades a day. Um, what are your they're, they're, that's not a good combination. Whereas if you're, if you're doing three or four trades, sorry, Steve, you're going to ask no, me something. No. Uh, please go, please continue. So, yeah. So um, Eugene is perfectly exactly in agreement with myself. You know, the same signal means something completely different to everybody. But right. I was just starting to talk about streaks. And, and so, you know, the type of trader who maybe three winners could be it for them. That fills them so full of this is so easy that they give it all back, right? So their, their weakness is three winners in a row. And we look at that fourth trade and we go, do you know that that's, you know, returning you, you know, it's, it's, it's knocking out half your profits for the year by just that habit. So that's the kind of reason. So of course, those, those next trades are going to take those signals completely differently. Right. No, so the signal doesn't count. It's the execution. It's the risk management. It's planning your exits, right. good or bad. It's, and it's measuring. Piece. Yeah. Yeah. It's consistency all over the place. Consistency. Over days and days and weeks and months, because every time you move away from your the strategy you have you have built over weeks with the tools that you are familiar and you are happy with, and the moment that you have a winning streak and at the moment you have a losing one, it's the exact moment where the human uh, element uh, come into play and that's where you have you are a good trader or a bad trader it's like do i want to uh, implement a new trade that will offset my uh, my loss here or i say okay you know what uh, i've made my day my rules are these ones and i don't change them and so this like uh, the discipline that, that is super difficult to uh, to follow uh, for sure for any any traders i'm sure especially beginners now. now we are saying that if you have five consecutive losers um you should you must stop trading for the day right mm -hmm. and if they choose to trade all of their trades after that are marked as undisciplined Right. Because what we find is we, we grade every single trade and it, it's your own plan. If they decide to change five to four or to six, you know, as they get more mature, they can. But what we find is that traders, if we take the trades where they stick to their plan, 80 percent of losing traders make money. Right. So it is right. those moments where they lose their own discipline. Right. That they lose all their money. Those few trades could make the difference between. Uh, Absolutely. Between, uh, 
most traders, if you count the number of trades that they had to eliminate to become profitable, it's really small. Hmm. It's often three or 4% of their trades. So that's why everyone listening uh, to all the traders out there and investors that are, uh, you know, uh, tuned in here, uh, discipline is, is key in following a strategy. And, uh, you know, to back to what uh, Nima mentioned uh, earlier about observing some, you know, traders uh, who have maybe deviated from their trading strategy in, in the past couple of months. Um, what are your thoughts, Anne, about um, like if you're trading? I, I think I've noticed this with some Bitcoin traders where they might be long the underlying, you know, in a small percentage of the portfolio, but then they have another portion of their portfolio where they're day trading the asset. And, you know, if a trade goes bad, maybe they'll just, you know, turn it into a long-term position, which obviously is, is, is not good if you need to sell the next day or if you need the money because then you're stuck in that trade as opposed to, you know, a real day trader that's in and out at the end of every day or, you know, if you're a swing trader. Uh, but have you noticed uh, people who will, you know, have like a long position in, let's say, the Euro USD, but then kind of have you know, a certain percentage of the rest of their portfolio where they're, you know, going long and short the euro um, while they keep that larger, you know, longer term uh, directional position. Um, I think beginners struggle a huge amount with that because many, many uh, traders um, see their profitability as their closed trades. Right. And so they will, you know, be look at look at so three or four open positions and two of them are making a little bit of money and two are losing a little bit. They're highly likely to close the two winners for small wins and they're highly likely to leave the, the losing trades open on the hopes that they're going to return. Right. And so um, we have invented something called disposition, which is how much time do you spend in winners compared to losers? And if it's less than one, you're doing that. You have that behavior right? Which means you're not giving your winners time to run and you're not letting your losers, you're not closing out your losers quickly enough, okay? Like class, and many, many people do that. Winner. Yeah, so they might have a long losing position sitting there for days and then they'll try and make some of it back on little short trades, right? And, you know, what they're doing is they, they, they're ignoring the losers and trying to focus on quick wins and then they see some profitable trades go in and they're looking at their realized P&L and, you know, traders can convince themselves for a long time that they're doing okay, but they've got a couple of bad opens, right? And right. we are very keen that people look holistically at the whole approach, right? And you've got to look at your opens and close together and the behavior, as much as winning streaks and losing streaks is important, it's really important if you're in one right now. And, and that's when you have to manage, right? Right. Absolutely. So I think we're, uh, we're uh, running a little short on time and, and we have some questions uh, from the audience that I uh, want to get to here uh, while I still have all you guys here with me. Um, basically, um, we probably have time for a few questions. So I'm just checking the comments section here. And okay, um, the first question I hear is, um, wait, this one I think we already addressed earlier, just so happened. Um, okay, do you believe the US dollar will weaken from all the stimulus programs? And what about the Japanese yen and other countries that are printing money? So my perspective is that um, in the long run, we get inflation, right? That there's no question that we are debasing our currencies here. Um, I think the question, uh, you know, currency trading is, is about comparative analytics, right? It's about, you know, which country is going to outperform the other. So that's where it's really hard to figure out, uh, like, who, who is going to be, you know, where people are going to go, right? Um, you know, I think as, as we come out of this, is the dollar, you know, still that safe haven, which is, of course, where, where people go to. I think it probably sees some downside as, as the markets begin to settle. Um, but, uh, you know, I, I do think there will be some really interesting trends as we see, the, as I said earlier, the countries come out of this with different uh, policies and we see different growth uh, environments. Excellent. Uh, is there anyone else that uh, wanted to add to that? I think Eugene addressed it pretty well. Uh, we could move on. 
the next here is what is the best way to diversify when markets are volatile? Are successful traders using gold, crypto, and oil uh, along with Forex and stocks? Well, I'll, I'll jump in. I think Ann really has the right answer there. Um, and that is don't trade too many things and don't trade too many sectors. Uh, they, they move differently. They behave differently. Yes, you need some diversification. But if you're an active trader, know your space. Uh, don't, don't try to cover them all. Uh, that, that's a ticket to, you know, what Ann was saying. You know, just yeah. you're going to get lost. Too much information and it's better to just... I, I, I think even just diversification actually can backfire to a certain extent, almost to what Eugene and Ann were uh, saying at one point. Uh, so that diversification is kind of a tricky word when I hear it. It makes me more nervous for the trader than um, yeah, concerned or happy for the trader. Diversification is good for an investment strategy, right? It's good for a long-term strategy. It's not good for a trading strategy necessarily. Exactly, I agree. And especially when the, the market is crashing, uh, everything crash at the same time. So there's no safe haven in, uh, on the short front. So correlation goes to one all over the place. Uh, we, we even see that gold was not necessarily uh, acting as a pure uh, refuge play at some point. So right, initially it's pulled off. Yeah, yeah, that's why it's really important to understand these events on the chart and be able to see what the different, you know, be able to do that cross market analysis and show what different events are happening because what trauma says is dead on the money. Uh, correlations go to one in these environments and you need to be able to see that and understand that. Excellent. I think we have time for one last question. I, I see here one. Um, my friend mentioned that hedging is becoming more popular to play both sides of volatility. Are you seeing many traders using hedging in their trading? I think we kind of talked about this a little bit, but not directly hedging. Uh, but, uh, I've, we've definitely seen with our clients a pickup and option activity, uh, which is, you know, uh, either a way to manage your risk or to hedge. Um, you know, both are, are tied together. Um, so uh, we're definitely seeing that. And I think, you know, tools that help you understand the options market, the volatility in the options market, the skew in the options market, your payoffs, those are all critical tools. And I think that, you know, in this environment, that's, that's something that, you know, the, the vendor and broker community needs to continue to invest as, as we are facing change in this environment and we have to deal, uh, we have to move forward and embrace that, right? This is what we see coming out of this is going to be different. Excellent. Yeah. The, the retail, uh, the retail community is much is much more educated now than it, they, they were before because there's a lot of uh, tools available. So now hedging is using options is not as complex as it seems before. Right. Uh, there are many uh, many uh, brokers that try to uh, simplify even the. The, the lexicon of the options and without using words like uh, skew or time structure that could be uh, uh, scary for, for some people that just say volatility, implied volatility is a measure of risk, skew, a measure of downside risk or upside, time structure over the time. So it's, uh, it's easier. So people are, are edge uh, more easily uh, because they understand better. Because they have more. We, uh, I meant to ask because I don't, I don't work in uh, options so much. But how's the pricing of the premiums now with all the volatility? I mean, I, I would imagine the premiums are extremely high these days. Or I mean, how's that going? Uh, the premium is higher with implied volatility, of course. Right. <laughs> uh, I, I also read that uh, when when the interest rates come down, that causes the call options to be more expensive, but the put options to be a little cheaper. But as Jerome mentioned, now with implied volatility so high you know, you're kind of overpaying a little bit for, I guess, those premiums. But yes, because actually the, the implied volatility is higher than the, the historic volatility, I would say. So you are paying a premium. So buying calls are not necessarily the best thing to do uh, right now. You're, you, you tend to sell uh, volatility and the professional uh, options trader uh, in that space are constantly uh, selling uh, volatility, buying, right. uh, receiving premium, and, and get some return. So, usually, and back you, to your point, make, 
some money in the uh, in down uh, down market because they are yeah. just collecting uh, these uh, stuff. So. And to your point, now soon uh, it's becoming easier for traders to do those sophisticated strategies, even though they're you know they could be very risky, uh, because the brokers are making it easier to understand the, the terminology whether you're doing like a net credit spread or, or some other bearish call type of, uh, you know, advanced options. Um, but I, I wish we had more time to discuss, uh, you know, so many uh, fascinating, fascinating topics with you guys. And I, I'm sure this has been, uh, you know, uh, great for our listeners. So um, yeah, thank you. I want to thank all the speakers here and thank all of our listeners from all over the world for uh, tuning in today. And uh, yeah, you know, uh, we're going to say goodbye and uh, wish you success in your ongoing efforts with trading and at this conference today. So thank you all. Thank you, Steve. Thank you all. Pleasure to meet you. Have a good day. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Pleasure to speak with you.